What hilarious solution did Marvel come up with to help Paul Bettany remove his vision makeup more easily? Why does Ray Fiennes fear women's tights after his role as Voldemort? And why was Emma Watson afraid of Dan Stevens' padded muscle suit on the set of Beauty and the Beast? Hi, I'm Janet, and let's get into it. Vision. Just came to show me the initial drawings and stuff. I totally flipped, and I didn't think for a minute what that was actually gonna mean to me physically. <laughs> Vision might be Marvel's most composed superhero, but Paul Bettany, the actor beneath Vision's layers of vibrant makeup, isn't afraid to speak out about his discomfort. According to Paul, the extensive process behind turning himself red before every filming session has taken a toll on his skin. I hate talking about things like this, he said, because you always sound like a complaining actor. It's hard to talk about the discomfort of a costume and makeup, but I will. Before every shoot, Paul had to sit in a makeup chair for more than three hours. He had huge prosthetic pieces that went from his eyebrows all the way down to his shoulder blades, and the same thing around his neck. I get put inside this, you know, rubber balaclava that is then glued to my face, and it's a lot of prosthetics. So the makeup is actually amazingly quick, I think, for what is accomplished. It's and it wasn't really the application process that bothered him, but rather the fact that he had to sit in it for the rest of the day. The only parts of his skin that could actually breathe were his hands. After so much suffering, you'd think Paul would jump at removing the makeup. But unfortunately, that too had its own challenges. Oh. <laughs> Holy <laughs> it's you and McGregor. Oh. <laughs> it is you and McGregor! According to Paul, it's very hard to get off. And much like a cheap peel-off face mask, it can do some damage to your skin, especially if you're working six days a week. To help soothe his skin, Marvel has brought in a tiny mobile sauna to speed up the removal process. At the end of the night, Paul would get into the sauna and sit there with a beer. He'd be fully dressed in robes with hot towels over his head, and he'd sit in there to try and sweat the makeup off. Even those pieces that don't sweat off are much easier to remove afterwards. When asked what it was like functioning on set with his costume on, Paul said that he couldn't hear very well. He felt kind of isolated, like he was in a box. At least he had a cooling mechanism, which is a suit beneath the costume that pumps ice-cold water around him. It might sound super high-tech, but this solution has even been used in shows like Netflix's Umbrella Academy. But more on that in a second. I wear a cooling suit that has piping that goes all around me and they plug it in and ice water runs through it and it keeps me cool. It's a little like being inside a gin and tonic. When in costume, Paul said there was a lot of sitting down, reading, and just trying to focus on how fortunate he was to be a part of that. At least he's a humble guy. Voldemort. Rafe, you hate aesthetics and things, don't you? I don't love them, no. But don't you, like, you choose jobs to avoid them? After Voldemort, I did. I have. He might not be everyone's favorite, but let's face it, the Harry Potter franchise wouldn't have been the same without he who must not be named. Voldemort might not have featured in the first few movies, but when he finally made his return to the Wizarding World, the casting directors couldn't have found anyone better to portray the role than acclaimed actor Ray Fiennes. That's right, behind Voldemort's hollow eyes and pale skin is the same actor who played in award-winning films like The Grand Budapest Hotel and Schindler's List, and Made in Manhattan alongside the one and only Jennifer Lopez. In order to portray the rotten Voldemort, Rafe had to undergo a radical transformation prior to every filming session. And despite the Dark Lord keeping a low profile throughout the franchise, Rafe had the makeup applied around 60 to 70 times. What makes things even more unbelievable is the fact that the makeup crew had limited time on their hands. Because the movies featured so many children, shooting times were limited due to mandatory classroom time and general child labor laws. As such, Rafe's makeup routinely had to be speedy. According to two-time Oscar-winning makeup artist Marc Coulier, who was personally responsible for getting Rafe made up, he managed to cut the application time down to two hours, which is still pretty lengthy. To turn Rafe into a subhuman monster, Marc and his team used eyebrow blockers, and they created veins with temporary tattoos. So that the forehead is actually made of gelatin, just basically ordinary household gelatin which is translucent, but it enables us to cover up his own eyebrows because he wouldn't want to shave his own eyebrows off. They used dark eye makeup around his eyes, as well as fake fingernails, teeth, and even some paint on his hands. Despite all the cosmetics, though, there was one element to Voldemort that couldn't be created through the magic of makeup. That's right, it's his flat, snake-like nose, which becomes more and more exaggerated as the series continues. Instead of relying on practical effects, the filmmakers opted for a bit of digital wizardry. Every time Rafe appeared in a shot, his nose had to be carefully edited out, and his snake-like nostrils added. 
my nose down into place. As for his costumes, Rafe apparently had quite the comical situation happening under his flowing robes. In an interview with Graham Norton, the actor admitted that he couldn't handle the women's tights which he was originally given. What happened was that the tights used to work their way down, so the, gus the gusset of the tight <laughs> was sort of around my knees. So I couldn't walk as elegantly as I would like as Voldemort. <laughs> he begged the costume designer to cut a part of them off, leaving him with a garter belt and suspenders throughout the rest of the production. Can you imagine this type of chaos going on under Voldemort's robes? Kind of makes him less intimidating, doesn't it? As far as villains go, Voldemort is definitely up there in the ranks of most terrifying, alongside Disney's Maleficent, who we'll also take a look at in a moment. Still though, it seems like Rafe has more in common with his character than we think. While in costume, he apparently couldn't resist the urge to give some people on set a little scare. I passed by this little child. I just looked at this boy. He just burst into tears. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> apparently, this gave him all the confidence he needed to take on Harry, Ron, and Hermione. Before we go on, why don't you take a moment to subscribe? The Catcher brings you new uploads throughout the week, and you wouldn't want to miss all the latest real-life dramas and behind-the-scenes secrets of all your favorite shows. Mystique. There's no CG for me. Um, it's it's all it's the same technology, the same methods they were using on Rebecca Romaine, the original Mystique. That's right. Portraying Mystique doesn't come easily. Jennifer Lawrence actually gets covered from head to toes before every filming session. In an interview, she said it used to take up to eight hours, but later lessened to three. What do you do for eight hours? Just sitting, you just have oh to sit God. there, right? Well, I stood or I had to sit on a bicycle seat. Which every woman knows is our dream come true. <laughs> when asked what it took to transform into Mystique, Jennifer said the scales were attached first, followed by three layers of blue paint airbrushed onto her, and then another five layers, which would give off a splattering effect. I thought I was just gonna lay so, down did you go, um, for you like mind? six hours you go and just like go to door? sleep while this oh, is going Yeah. I didn't shot. realize I too and was going to have to. Luckily, the makeup crew ended up ditching the full body paint for a bodysuit later in the franchise because the paint started to irritate Jennifer's skin and they actually had to call a doctor to set. Once the change was made, instead of being painted all over, Jennifer was only painted from the neck up, which also drastically lessened the prep time. But this doesn't mean everything was suddenly perfect. In an interview, Jennifer opened up about not being able to use the bathroom at all while in costume. I burst into her bathroom <laughs> with a BB gun while she was trying to pee he in her funnel. He me <laughs> while I'm like, it's so hard to do because you have to stop <laughs> while you're in the middle of peeing to let the rest of it go out. Like, that's a whole scientific process. <laughs> Mortifying, right? I know that everybody feels sorry for me, but we have so much fun. It's like a sleepover, except I'm naked and being painted. <laughs> Maleficent. Angelina Jolie seems to have made the role of Maleficent her own. From the not quite human eyes to her disconcerting cheekbones, the talented creatives behind the movie, with Angelina herself as the executive producer, have conjured up a character who is both beautiful and terrible at the same time. But it wasn't easy. No detail, right down to the pointy teeth in the back of her mouth, was overlooked. Prosthetic specialists, makeup artists, and teams of costume designers worked together to bring Maleficent to life. According to the special effects maker, Makeup artist, Maleficent's hyper chiseled cheekbones aren't Angelina's natural jawline. They're prosthetics, carefully applied to look supernatural but beautiful at the same time. Apparently, Disney were very nervous in the beginning, fearing that Angelina might become unrecognizable. But Angelina herself insisted, and only after agreeing to have executives at the first few makeup tests did the network sign off on it. Originally, Maleficent was supposed to have a prosthetic forehead and chin as well, but that ended up being scrapped, as it made Angelina look too devilish. When it came to the villain's skin, Angelina didn't want it to be green, like the original animated Maleficent's, as it might have been too distracting. It wasn't natural either, so they settled on a shade quite a bit paler than Angelina's natural skin tone. It took about three hours to apply the makeup and one hour to remove it every day. Angelina was in full makeup for 70 days, often more than 16 hours at a time. She couldn't apply moisturizer before coming to set, and the makeup artists still ended up 
stripping her face of any oil before applying the prosthetics. Sounds harsh, right? Well, it doesn't stop there. In order to achieve Maleficent's creepy eyes, Angelina had to wear hand-painted contact lenses. And for her nails, she not only had to wear long stick-ons, but they were all individually painted bright red underneath for an extra layer of details. And what about those horns? Angelina's team placed a skull cap over her hair, and the horns were attached with magnets so that they could be removed easily. According to the designer, there were several different pairs of horns that are all of varying size and heaviness for different shots. When Angelina had to move a lot, she couldn't wear the heavier horns as they might have come off. Despite the less than luxurious costuming process, Angelina herself seems to have been the driving force behind her final look. She pushed the designers to be edgier and riskier and knew exactly where she wanted her character to go. When the designers played it safe, she'd make them push the boundaries. After all, you don't say no to Maleficent. The Beast. Puppeteering the suit for the motion capture. Disney's live-action remake of Beauty and the Beast was an instant hit, reaching the box office rank of the 10th biggest movie of all time. Whether this achievement is due to the stellar actors, breathtaking cinematography, or the touching music, definitely know the costumes have had to play a part. So how did the production team turn human actor Dan Stevens into the iconic animal man, the Beast? Believe it or not, CGI is just that good these days. On set, Dan wore a tracking suit, bulked out with padding to represent the sun size and shape of the beast. This was only used in scenes where the Beast had to interact with Belle, such as the ballroom scene. In addition to the padding, Dan also had to occasionally walk around on springy stilts to achieve the appropriate height for his character. Crazy, right? Dan's facial expressions were captured and applied to the Beast's animation. But because his expressions couldn't always be caught clearly on set, Dan had to come in after hours to be filmed in a booth. And my face would be sprayed with about 10,000 UV dots, and I would sit in what I used to call the Tron cage. It was sort of UV, UV lights and 27 little cameras. It's not as glamorous as the castle ballroom, but it definitely worked. In terms of the beast itself, another custom tool had to be used to simulate the beast's flowing hair. Each of his hairstyles were called a groom because they needed several for when the beast is outside fighting, primping himself for his date, or just interacting with Belle on a daily basis. The most difficult scene? The ballroom scene, of course. Emma Watson performed the scene with Dan in his muscle suit, and the visual effects team was called upon to help sell the highly emotional moment. They had to make the Beast look like he's in love, but also like he's not sure how to behave. There was a lot of change happening in his facial expressions, and also the stature of his body. And the biggest problem of all, Emma Watson was absolutely terrified of dancing with Dan on stilts. Which was slightly terrifying for me, but probably more for Emma. I think she was very worried that I was going to tread on her toes in steel stilts, um, which could have ruined the movie, uh, but I didn't. Luther Hargraves. You know him from Netflix's Umbrella Academy, the big and oddly proportioned superhero with a type of clumsiness to him. His secret? From the neck down, Luther is not a man, but a gorilla man hybrid. Of course, Tom Hopper, the actor behind Luther Hargraves, knew his character's secret all along. I looked at the comics before I was cast, he said, and I was like, oh my god, this guy is a human head on a gorilla body. This is nuts! Rightly so. This wild concept required a team of costume designers and prosthetic manufacturers to work together to pull off the reveal without breaking the show's delicate blend of style and realism. The designers had to, first of all, build an ape suit, yet none of them really knew how to approach that. While they wanted to stay as true as possible to the original comics, they wanted to tone the costume down a bit. On top of that, certain aspects regarding the comic character didn't really work the same on actual humans. Their first effort was a massive muscle suit, but they quickly realized it had to be smaller because Tom himself is quite fit. Some of the larger proportions started to look odd and unnatural, like the Hunchback of Notre Dame, they called it. And even though Luther hides his deformed body with a jacket throughout most of the series, the crew still needed the jacket to be the realistic size of something hiding such a big and hairy secret. Needless to say, the jacket was very, very hot, especially when the production moved into the summer. Tom was equipped with a cooling suit underneath, like the one Paul Bettany wears as Vision. Tom said, I went from being the coziest, warmest guy on set to being the hottest guy on set. Every take I was like, I've got to get this off. I've got to get this off. It got crazy hot. When making the final gorilla suit, the team took a mold of Tom's body from the neck down, and they began the process of making it look hairy, like an ape. 
Rather than apply strips of hair in bunches, each strand was hand sewn into the suit. While this was really time consuming, it did allow the team to focus on more subtle details, like scar tissue from Luther trying to remove the skin. This added another layer of depth to his character. Even though the gorilla body only makes several prominent appearances, it was really delicate and easily broke down in action-packed scenes. The rave in which Tom danced in the bare-chested suit for hours posed a particular risk. According to the actor, he destroyed it more than he did when punching in it. On top of that, Tom was absolutely dripping inside the suit from the heat. He couldn't take a break and he couldn't go to the bathroom. That's why he made sure he did everything he had to before getting into that suit. Hopefully now that season three is on its way, they found a way to make things easier for Tom. We can only hope, right? Which one was your favorite costume? Let us know in the comments below. Thanks for watching.